Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're gonna do a quick unboxing and impressions video of the new Ambernic Win 600 device. Now I've been a little bit excited about this device, but I do have some trepidation about some of the specs as well. So in this video today, we're gonna kind of dig into that whole thing. And the reason why I've been pretty excited about it is that this has the potential to be the very first budget handheld Windows PC. And personally, I've been excited about getting a device in this kind of spec range, something that is low powered and low cost, but can play a bunch of indie games and then also do some light emulation as well. And so I'm hoping the Win 600 is gonna check off all of those boxes. But of course, as we know, Ambernic also tends to have a few red flags with all their systems too. And so I'm hoping to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that in this quick impressions video. I think it's gonna take a while for me to test this device and give you a good final review view, so I don't expect to do that for another week or so. And because this device can both dual boot Windows and Steam OS, that means I have twice as many things to test first. But at the very least, I'm going to be able to test how it feels in the hands, the size of it all together, as well as the screen, you know, all those kind of quick impression things, which is what I'm gonna do in this video here. Now the device is actually arriving today. I don't have it in my hands here. So I'm gonna get it here in a couple hours and then I'll start filming here on my desk and then I'll have this released tomorrow morning. But either way, my goal is to give you a quick 20 minute impressions of this device to let you know whether or not it's worth considering when it does go for sale in about a week. And so without any further delay, let's jump into the future here in a few hours from now and do the unboxing and impressions. Let's go. Okay, so first thing here, you can see that the box is a little bit different than usual. It's flatter and wider. It has a separate box for accessories. And as you can see here, it comes with a 45 watt charger and a USB-C to USB-C cable. Now here's the big reveal. Now it looks like they sent me the white model, but there is a gray model as well. It comes with a screen protector as well as a manual that will tell you all the different functions and hotkeys as well. So let's get our hands on the device next. And first impressions, this is a pretty hefty device. It feels good and balanced in the hands. It has some weight to it, but the distribution feels balanced. Second impression is I'm not a huge fan of the plastic they used here. It's a hard coated plastic and it feels just a little bit slick in the hands. I think it might get a little bit sweaty as I start to use it. On the back, you can see it has an intake vent and then a small logo here too. Now I do appreciate the ergonomic grips here on each side. They do feel nice and rounded. It does make the device rest pretty easily in the hands. On the bottom, we have down firing stereo speakers, as well as what looks to be a microphone input and a headphone jack. Now by virtue of not having a USB-C attachment here on the bottom, this will not be a dockable device. At least not in that traditional switch sense, you're not gonna be able to plop it down inside of a dock and have it work. Let's look at the left side first. We have volume up and down as well as the power button. On the right side, we have an on-screen keyboard button as well as a toggle between a mouse and gamepad input. This should make it pretty handy when navigating through the menus, but to be honest, I just switched mine to gamepad and then connected a mouse and keyboard when I needed it. Up top, we have the exhaust for the fan. It does get pretty hot when using it. We also have a reset button, a USB-A connector, which comes in very handy, and then also a USB-C connector, which will both charge as well as use accessories. And this is capable of video out. Now let's talk a little bit about these shoulder buttons. These are stacked shoulder buttons, some of the first from Ambernic ever. And I gotta say the feel of both these shoulder and trigger buttons here is very, very nice. Now these buttons have a connector near the center of the device, which means that they're easier to press down on the further away you get from that center. And so I would say if you want to have the best experience possible, you want to push them kind of closer to the outside of the device. And as I'll show later in the video, when it comes to ergonomics, that's the best way to press it anyway. But I gotta say, you know, these buttons feel very professional and nice. They're soft and smooth and very responsive too. These are easily the best shoulder and trigger buttons that Ambernic has made. I would just say, don't expect to press near the center of the device, but more towards the edge. After that, you're gonna love it. Now, this is the second device to release with stack shoulder buttons. The first was the Ambernic RG353P, which was just like last week. And these are similar, but a little bit longer and also kind of a little skinnier too. And these aren't bad shoulder and trigger buttons either, but if I had to choose between the two, it's gonna be the Win 600 all day. The Win 600 buttons just feel a little bit more responsive and much smoother to press down on too. Now, sadly, these aren't analog inputs here on the triggers, but all the same, they feel really great and some of the best that I felt with a digital input. So yeah, against all odds, I actually really like these shoulder and trigger buttons. 
So now let's spend some time talking about the face of the device. We'll talk about each of these buttons individually and kind of go from there. Start and select our rubber membrane buttons. They're kind of very typical of Amronic buttons. And the face buttons are just dead ringers to other devices they've released before. And if you've ever tried an Ambernic device or watched any of my other videos, you know that's going to be a really good thing. These are really excellent rubber membrane connections that have a classic retro feel. Now on each side they have a hotkey. This one here on the right is a Windows hotkey. But thankfully this button is actually flush with the device. You can see it doesn't stick out at all. In fact you have to very deliberately press down on it, but it's still not very hard to press down on when you want to. Same thing on the other side, which has a home hotkey. Each of these have a short press function as well as a long press function. For example, on the left, if you long press the home button, it's going to function as an escape key. Now the D-pad on this device is really good too. Again, very typical of an Ambernic D-pad. Nice pivot, good travel, and has a classic retro feel. So if we only take into account the D-pad and face buttons, this feels really good as a device. But I think like most other people, I'm a little bit worried about the ergonomics of these analog sticks. These are Switch style analog sticks and they just look very small on this larger device. In terms of range of motion, this is fine, like they actually work out pretty well. I wish they weren't so recessed, I think they could have been pushed up a little bit more. This is a device that is obviously not going to be pocketable, and so for that reason I don't know why you would have to make the analog sticks so recessed as well. And it is a bit of a stretch if you're going to be using the analog sticks and then trying to use the shoulders or triggers, the triggers in particular. I personally have medium sized hands and it's not an impossible place to reach, but it does feel a little bit awkward. It's kind of a stretch and we'll test this more when we're actually playing a game here in a second. But for now, let's take a look at the screen. Now this is a 720p resolution 6 inch display with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And that's going to be pretty ideal when playing light PC games. The screen itself sits flush with the case. It looks very nice. But I definitely think I'm going to be putting that screen protector on it here soon. It does have some bezels to it, but they're not huge. And I will show that off more when the games are actually playing. So in terms of overall design, I actually am a pretty big fan. There's only two things that I have any complaints about. Number one is the feel of the plastic. It's a little bit hard and slick and it makes it feel less premium for a device that is the most premium Ambernic device ever created. And then secondly, while it does feel really great when using the D-pad and face buttons, I'm a little bit concerned about the long-term ergonomics when you use the analog sticks plus the triggers. Ideally, it would be a much shorter distance between the two. Look how it is with an Xbox controller here. It's almost half the distance between the analog stick and the triggers, as you can see. Even something like the PS5 controller, which has a greater distance here, is still quite a bit less than what's on the Ambernic Win 600. And I do think this distance here is going to just make you hold the device at a weird angle and it'll probably get tiring over time. I had similar complaints about the other large device from Amronic, the RG552, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that the trigger buttons were in line and they were not stacked. So that meant you kind of had to hold your hand like a claw in order to hit the L2 and R2 buttons plus the analog sticks. And this was just kind of a nightmare when it came to ergonomics. Now comparably the Win 600 is a lot more comfortable than that. But all the same, just because it's more comfortable doesn't make it actually comfortable. So we'll test this more when we actually get into the gameplay. Next, let's do some size comparisons. We'll start with some smaller devices and work our way up. Smallest among them would be something like the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. This is a three and a half inch screen, and as you can see, the device is almost as small as the screen itself. Even something like Ambernic's RG353P, even though it's quite a lot bigger than the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, is still a lot smaller than the Win 600. Moving up next, we have the Ambernic RG552. This one's about three finger lengths smaller than the Win 600. Next would be the Nintendo Switch Lite, which is about two finger lengths smaller. And then just another step up would be the AYN Odin. I would say this one's about mm, one and a half finger lengths less wide. In fact, the size between these two is not really all that different, at least when you're looking at it head on like this. The big difference is going to be in thickness. As you can see here, the Win 600 is about twice as thick as the Odin Pro. Moving to devices that are about the same size, we have the GPD XP Plus. This one's about the same width, but not as tall as the Win 600. That being said, that was one of my main complaints about the XP Plus is that it's too narrow of a device. But the XP Plus has a couple things going for it. Number one is some really excellent analog sticks, and the fact that the analog stick on the left is above the D-pad. I think that's a better fit. The device that's closest in size is actually the OLED version of the Nintendo Switch. This one does have a larger screen. I think it's something 
getting closer to six and a half, maybe seven inches altogether. And it also has those offset analog sticks, which I think are better served with a device that's primarily going to use analog sticks anyway. But yeah, these are about the same size until you actually prop them up. And as you can see, the Nintendo Switch is also about half the thickness as well. Now let's talk about devices that are bigger than the Win 600. We'll start with the Ionia RetroPower 2021. Now this one has a 7 inch screen but also much bigger bezels and that does make the device quite a bit bigger than the Win 600. It's a similar story with the Ionia Next. These two have the exact same screen, same as the Steam Deck as well, but this one's just longer altogether too. And when it comes to analog sticks, this one has the best of any device I've ever used. These are nice and chunky like they are in an Xbox gamepad. But I would say the D-pad on the Win 600 is better than this one here. In terms of thickness, these are about the same thickness. And you know, honestly, I have no complaints about the thickness of the Win 600. The chunkiness here actually feels really premium in the hand. Now let's talk about the big one. Here's the Steam Deck. This thing is probably 30% bigger than the Win 600, which is already a big device. Now that doesn't make the Win 600 pocketable, but it does make it a lot more portable. That being said, I love the control scheme with the Steam Deck having all the controls right there ready for your thumbs. Okay, let's do some weights. This is 493 grams altogether, so a little bit less than half a kilo. That makes it about 25% heavier than the Amronic RG552 or even the AYN Odin. In fact, it's still a bit heavier than the OLED Switch, but it is lighter than, say, something like the RetroPower 2021 or even the Steam Deck. And the heaviest among them all is going to be the Aya Neo next. This thing is 750 grams. That's crazy. So yeah, overall, I think 493 grams for a handheld Windows PC is actually a pretty nice weight. It's not something you could throw in a pocket, but all the same, this is definitely something I could play for several hours. And placement of the analog sticks aside, you know, holding it while using the D-pad and the face buttons is very, very comfortable. The overall thickness makes it feel nice and hefty in the hands. And the raised grips here at the bottom just kind of ball up into your palm and it just feels naturally good. And because this is a larger device, you have plenty of space here for your fingers on the back, which again makes this device feel nice and balanced in the hands. So yeah, I think when it comes to D-pad gaming, this thing is going to be a clear winner. But now let's turn it on and kind of get a feel for what we can expect, at least on the Windows side for now. Now this device is going to ship with Windows 10, but it is possible to use SteamOS with it as well. And for this preview video, I'm not going to get into that. We're just going to stick to the Windows side, but I will have future videos that will talk you through the rest of that process. Now the device does have a touch screen, so you could just kind of navigate through everything using the touch and the on-screen keyboard, but I am going to make things a little bit easier on myself. I'm going to use a USB-C hub like this one here. This will allow me to plug in things like an external hard drive, keyboard and mouse, as well as an external display and to charge of the device at the same time. So first thing I did is I plugged it all up and then I went into the display settings and then changed it to say show only on two. This will make it so that it shows up in my screen capture card but it's not going to display anything on the device itself. That's going to help it save on battery life in the long run. Now I'm not going to bore you with the setup process but I did go on to say for example Ninite and then I installed Chrome and Steam as well as like WinRAR and 7-Zip. From there, I plugged in an external hard drive and then moved over a bunch of emulated games so I could test that as well. Next, I went into Steam and downloaded a bunch of games. I focused mostly on the lightweight PC games just because they have a faster download, and those are the ones I'm most interested in playing on this device. Now, I will talk more about the hardware components later on in my review video, but as you can see, I'm using the AMD Athlon Silver 3050E, and it has 256 gigs of internal storage, as well as 8 gigabytes of RAM. Now, unfortunately, this is a single-channel RAM slot. We'll talk more about that in the review as well, and we'll also do a teardown so you can see what that's like inside. And before we get into gaming, I did want to test out the thermal performance, so I'm going to run CPU temp and then also run the torture test. At idle, it runs at about 5 watts, but when you push it to 100% load, it is going to give you an 18 watt max. The temperature also spiked at about 83 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's do some quick game testing. This is only going to be kind of a cursory test here, but I did want to get a feel for the ergonomics and what to expect, at least out of the box. I started with some very light PC games and they ran at no problem. And this was exactly what I was hoping for. I think this device is going to shine with indie games, especially those games like Celeste, which will work really well with the D-pad. Because this has a very nice and precise D-pad, it's going to work really well for some of these challenging platformers. I did move it up to about the mid-tier of indie games, things like Hades, and I was happy to find that it ran at 60 frames per second, no problem whatsoever. And so that's a pretty good sign when it comes to PC gaming that you may be able to push it to some of those medium-tier games. 
Definitely not AAA or anything else like that, but at least something like Hades running well is a good sign. In terms of ergonomics, I wanted to try a first-person shooter like Half-Life 2. And you know, using the analog sticks like this isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's definitely not something that I was really enjoying. One thing I did find is that pressing the trigger buttons isn't so bad. What I ended up doing is pressing the very edge of them, which is very light and easy on the finger, but still nice and responsive. And so you don't need to kind of grip the whole thing and push down the whole button. All you have to do is kind of tap the edge right there. And that does make it more comfortable to hold, but all the same, it's not something I was really looking forward to. I think just overall using the left analog stick is a bit of an awkward position. It just feels a little bit less natural than using a d-pad, but all the same when you're just using one like on a 2D game like this, Shadow Complex Remastered, not the end of the world. Now unfortunately performance on this game in particular was not that great, it just couldn't maintain a very good frame rate. And so overall the gameplay was a little bit choppy. And probably the heftiest game I tried was Ori in the Blind Forest, and this is all just with the default settings, but as you can see it's getting between 40 and 55 frames per second. In general I found that it was pretty smooth gameplay, but there were moments where it felt a little bit slow and sluggish. So not a perfect gaming experience, but something that I would say is playable. Now I did just a little bit of emulation. What I did here is I just tried out some of the harder games on each of these systems, and once I got to a roadblock, then I moved on to the next one. And I'm happy to report that with PSP, even upping it to a 3x or 720p resolution, which is the max resolution the screen can handle, it played really well. Two of my benchmark games are Outrun 2006 and God of War Chains of Olympus. And both of these games played at 100% speed at 720p. To me, that's an indicator that almost the entire PSP library will be perfectly playable upscaled to 720p. Moving over to GameCube, I just tested everything at a native resolution with the Vulcan backend, and as you can see here, Mario Kart Double Dash ran really well. Not a single hiccup or anything. I used the same settings with Super Mario Sunshine, and this played really well at native resolution as well. But that being said, I did upscale this one to 720p later on, and unfortunately it did drop below 30 frames per second. It only went down to about 27 frames, but all the same, you could hear the stuttering in the audio, and it was a little bit glitchy too. I also tried F-Zero GX again at the native resolution and unfortunately this one capped out at about 45 frames per second. So I'm a little bit hesitant to show this gameplay right here because I haven't done any tweaks or anything. This is just out of the box performance. And so what I'm going to do in my final review is I'm going to mess around with other things. For example, I'm going to adjust the TDP and also see if I can do some emulation hacks to improve the gameplay as well. So just because it's not playing at full speed in this video doesn't mean it's impossible. Either way, let's move on to PS2. I started with Final Fantasy X, which is one of the easier PS2 games to play, again at native resolution, but this one played no problem. Moving up to Grand Theft Auto 3, unfortunately this one did have some significant slowdowns. On average I was getting about 55 frames per second, but it would dip below 50, which would have noticeable slowdown as well as audio stuttering. And unfortunately the max limit for this, at least for now, was going to be Ratchet & Clank. This one did not play at full speed with native resolution, either using the DirectX 11 plugin or the Vulkan backend. So PS2 is going to need some work as well. Now just for kicks I did want to try out other systems, for example here is Wii U running the CMU standalone emulator. And this one's kind of exciting because the Android based handhelds can't play this system at all. And I was surprised to find that Super Mario 3D World almost played at full speed. In fact it looked really nice and played smoothly, it just had a little bit of slowdown. I would say it was running at about 95% speed. Now bumping this up to Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD, unfortunately this one played at about half speed. And the unfortunate thing here is the GPU is the one that's being bottlenecked. I think that if this had dual channel RAM, you might actually be able to play this game at full speed. But I'm going to do more testing with that with the final review and see if we can get at least a little bit better performance. And finally, I wanted to try a system that is not so GPU intensive, and that is the PS3. The thing about the PS3 is it needs a lot of cores to run well, and unfortunately, at least on the default settings, the chip on this device just really wasn't up to the task. And so unfortunately, God of War 2 HD, one of the easier PS3 games to play, only played at about 75% speed. Okay, so that was a quick look at just some emulation performance right out of the box. And I think that's a good stopping point for our first impressions here. And so in the end, these are my three findings. There are a lot of things about this device that have already gotten me excited. I'm going to call those green flags. The size and weight of the device feel really nice in the hand, and the light PC gaming performance on this was excellent. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what I was hoping for this device. When it came to emulation, PSP was great, and Nintendo GameCube was mostly good. 
At first glance, the 6-inch 720p screen is very good. We'll do more testing with brightness and darkness settings later on in the final review. And when you're using the D-pad and face buttons primarily for your control inputs, it has a very nice overall feel. In fact, as soon as I got done filming all my footage and started editing this video, the first thing I wanted to do was just get back and start playing again. And surprisingly, that's not a feeling that I get very often when I have a new device, so that's a really good sign. Now that being said, there are some red flags here. Number one is that single channel RAM. I think that they're really going to throttle that GPU performance, and I'm not sure there's anything we can do about that. Additionally, the ergonomics overall when using the analog sticks is not great. Furthermore, the PS2 emulation leaves a lot more to be desired, but we are going to tweak that later. And as I was doing some of that more intensive emulation, the device itself got pretty warm. It wasn't to the point of being uncomfortable, but I did notice it. And finally, one of the bigger elephants in the room is we're just not sure what the pricing is quite yet. My worry is that even though this is going to be marketed as a budget Windows PC, I'm not quite sure it's actually going to be at a budget price. So more to come once we have an idea of what it's going to cost. And finally, there's quite a few things I want to test later on in my final review. I'm going to focus on things like battery life and SteamOS and try to get Botticera running as well. I'm also going to do more in-depth testing when it comes to emulation, and I'm really going to see what it can do in terms of its PC gaming limits. I think it's also going to be important to test streaming with this device, so I'll knock that one out too. And I want to see what kind of optimizations I can make with things like updating drivers and changing out the thermal settings as well. So honestly, there's still a lot more to come when it comes to testing this device. That's one of the cool things about using a Windows-based handheld. There's just a lot of different things you can do to get better performance. And that's what I've been hoping for this entire time now that we have a budget-based x86 handheld. So really, that's about it for this video, but there is definitely more to come. But at the end of the day, I do hope this gave you a pretty good impression of what to expect with the Win 600 going forward. I'm not quite ready to say whether or not this is going to be worth your money, especially because we don't know the price yet, but just based on the few hours I've had with the device already, I can tell you that it's going to be worth paying attention to. And the number one draw of this device is it's going to start shipping to everybody starting next week. All the other devices that we're all excited about are not going to ship until the end of this year. Meanwhile, the Win 600 could be out for several months before the next budget Windows handheld even appears. And for that reason alone, I do think it's going to be worth checking out this device when the final reviews start coming in. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found it helpful. As always, thank you for watching, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.